My name is Colin Mortimer, and I am the director of the Center for New Liberalism here at the Progressive Policy Institute. Today's event will be What is Cryptocurrency? Regulating an Unprecedented Technology. Cryptocurrency has taken the world by storm. The, depending on the day, digital currencies are now valued at several trillion dollars. Financial and non-financial corporate executives, once dismissive, increasingly understand the importance of cryptocurrency and related technologies for the future. However, the federal government is only in the early stages of deciding how to regulate cryptocurrency, which could have enormous implications going forward. In this briefing from the Progressive Policy Institute, industry leaders and experts will discuss the potential regulatory options for cryptocurrency, debating the merits and drawbacks of several proposed approaches. To kick things off, I am delighted to introduce Representative Jake Auchincloss. Representative Auchincloss is serving his first term in Congress, where he is the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee and a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. He represents the 4th District of Massachusetts. His areas of focus include infrastructure, housing, the life sciences, and energy policy. Representative Auchincloss is a graduate of Harvard College and MIT Sloan. Prior to, prior to being elected to Congress, he was a three-term city councilor in Newton, Massachusetts. While serving in the public sector on nights and weekends, Representative Auchincloss led product development at a Fortune 100 insurance company and a cybersecurity startup during the day. Representative Auchincloss, I'll turn it over to you for your remarks. Thanks, Colin. And I appreciate the PPI having me on for this important conversation. Uh, as you intimated, Colin, I, I come to Congress by way of the tech sector. I was the director of the MIT 100K Entrepreneurship Competition when I was an MBA student there, where I was uh, running an organization that saw literally hundreds of tech-driven startups uh, be judged, mentored, funded, launched, uh, and then went into the cybersecurity sphere as a product manager for a startup, and then into uh, the incubator of a, of a large insurance company where we worked on a whole host of products for the PNC industry. And in all those roles, I really primarily wore the hat of a product manager. And a product manager is meant to be uh, almost aggressively agnostic as to the technology that underpins any given product or solution, and is instead meant to be entirely focused on the customer pain point, the solution that needs to be delivered, and uh, constantly pressing the tech and engineering departments of your company. I don't care whether it's scotch tape or Python or blockchain, you solve this problem for these customers better than the competitors can. That's what's gonna get this product into market. That's, what I get, that's what's gonna get us product market fit, that holy grail of startups. Um, and that mindset I think is beneficial to me now that I'm in Congress because while I've done a lot of homework on blockchain and, and crypto and, and Web3 and, and understanding the true technical differentiators between Web3 and Web2, digital scarcity and data portability uh, and transparency of the public ledger, important technical differentiators for previous protocols. At the end of the day, as the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee, I'm agnostic as to the commercial prospects of Web3. That's not my role. That is the role of people like Dante, who, who are pioneering in the private sector to figure out the use cases and to deliver innovation that delights customers, changes markets, disrupts industries. My job as the, as the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee and as a member of Congress is to uphold market integrity, to protect consumers from fraud and abuse, and to create a regulatory sandbox in which industry can thrive, uh, in which participants in a marketplace can transact with confidence, uh, and in which the United States can lead the world in innovation. Congress, although we are moving deliberately, uh, is moving forward on these fronts. We've gone from a position a year ago, two years ago, when you know a lot of my colleagues probably were, were Googling what, uh, what Bitcoin was to a place where when the Financial Services Committee is asking questions of industry leaders, they are thoughtful, they are digging deep, um, and they are surfacing real clear and present next steps. 
And I think we're seeing increasing alignment both between the administration and Congress that the most important next step for us is to is stable coin auditing and disclosure. That for our markets to function effectively, for the United States to be able to attract the best entrepreneurs and grow world leading businesses here at home, we've got to have a regime for stable coin auditing and disclosure that is easy to comply with and that guarantees that if you are asserting that you've got a token backed by a dollar or any other currency that you can prove that and thereby uh, allow stable coins to be used as a currency in the, in the crypto realm. Uh, it's my strong preference and my, and my dedicated work over the next months and years that this legislation be organic with the industry and that it be collaborative and what I call pre-partisan. So by organic with the industry, what I mean is there's 150 different things right now that are floating around in terms of problems that could be solved or regulatory issues that are emerging. Trying to come up with a grand stratagem around all of them all at once, I think is a very fragile and even brittle approach. If you had tried to do that with the dot-com industry in 1992, I think you would have one, not gotten the problems right, and two, potentially thwarted some really important game-changing innovation. Instead, we should be looking at the clear and present next step, the clear problem that, that stakeholders and industry and the administration and the regulators and Congress can all agree is the real problem, stable core nodding and disclosure. Solve that problem thoughtfully and thoroughly. And by the time we finish solving it, probably half the problems that we thought we had right now will have been solved organically and another whole new crop will have emerged. And by regulating organically in tandem with the de development of the industry, we get much more resilient and sustainable regulatory architecture in which entrepreneurs can thrive as opposed to entire edifices that really can become a house of cards and collapse and that decrease certainty for those who are putting time, capital, talent uh, on the table. I'd also like to keep this pre-partisan. Uh, right now, we haven't yet kind of put on the jerseys about what side is what for, for crypto regulation. And I think that's healthy because there's no need for this to become a political football. This is something that thoughtful members on both sides of the aisle should be able to roll up their sleeves and work together on. Uh, I'm certainly working in that fashion and, and would like to see that we can get uh, Democrats and Republicans on board with uh, a long-term regulatory architecture for, the, for Web3. And I'll, I'll close here, having given sort of the set of challenges I think that government needs to, to meet the moment for, with a call to, to action and a challenge for industry, which is, and here I'm wearing my product, mark, product manager's hat again. Uh, there have been strong assertions made by entrepreneurs that you're gonna challenge high finance and Wall Street and disrupt that industry, and that you're gonna challenge big tech with data portability and, and transparency and disrupt that industry. Uh, and I would encourage you to, as, as you are maturing as an industry to make good on those promises and to demonstrate why Web3 is gonna solve some of the problems that have emerged in Web2 and why the natural impulse to centralize and sometimes centralization is always gonna be key is not gonna recreate the issues that we saw in the, in the transition from Web1 to, one, to Web2. Again, PPI, thanks for having me, and, and I'll turn it back over to you. Representative Alkenklaus, thank you so much for those fantastic remarks. Now let's turn over the discussion to our panelists. Dante Desparti is the Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy for Circle, a leading digital financial services firm building the most trusted treasury and payments infrastructure for the internet, including the fastest growing digital dollar currency, USDC. Prior to joining Circle, Dante served as the founding executive of the Deem Association, leading public policy, communications, membership, and social impact. Kirsten Wagner is the Chief Executive Officer at the Modern Markets Initiative. She has 15 plus years of experience as an advocate, thought leader, consensus builder before Congress and regulatory agencies in the areas of financial services regulation, electronic trading technology, and advancing savings and investment through innovation. Mike Katz is a Director of Legal for the Digital Currency Group. He handles all things legal from an operational, transactional, and strategic pers perspective for DCG. 
As counsel, Mike also works closely with DCG's subsidiaries and their leadership teams. Prior to joining DCG, Mike was, associ was an associate at Cooley LLP and Paul Weiss, representing emerging growth companies and venture capital funds in a diverse range of critical transactions. And finally, our moderator is PPI's own Michael Mandel. He is Vice President and Chief Economist at the Progressive Policy Institute in Washington, DC, and Senior Fellow at the Mack Institute for Innovation Management at the Wharton School. He was Chief Economist at Business Week prior to its pur purchase by Bloomberg. Mandel has written four books, including The Optimistic Rational Exuberance and his economics textbook, Economics, The Basics. He received a PhD in economics from Harvard University and taught at NYU's School of Business for many years. Michael, I now turn the event over to you. Thanks very much, Colin. And, and we should uh, give uh, Colin some kudos for putting this event together. It's really terrific at this point because obviously uh, the subject of who's, who's Who's going to regulate this industry is at the top of everybody's mind. The Biden administration is obviously grappling with this question. As we speak, there's probably sort of people sort of huddled in meeting rooms right now trying to sort of figure out what they're going to do next. Um, and so the big questions we're going to sort of look at today is who should regulate? Why? And what does it matter? So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to sort of Take a few minutes, maybe seven minutes each to sort of give your views on this question. And, uh, and then I'll ask some questions and then we'll sort of open it up for questions from the audience. And Kirsten, why don't you start first? Great, well, thank you so much for having me, Michael. This is a great group of people and PPI has been a wonderful organization to support um, thought leadership, especially for women. I um, participated in the Mosaic project of PPI and it was a wonderful experience. So thank you for including in this panel. But I think, look, I don't know that there has been clear consensus among industry on who should be the regulator, right? Some people have put out blueprints that there should be a new regulator for crypto. I personally feel like having worked with the CFTC and SEC for several decades now, that they are more than capable of regulating this industry. If anything, there's just um, maybe a need for some clarification on authority. We heard Chair Benham speak last week before Senate Ag about the need to have authority to um, from Congress to regulate and have access to the spot markets for cash um, crypto so they could actually do surveillance. I thought it was pretty alarming, and I guess we realize this already, but that the fines assessed so far by the CFTC on crypto have been the result of whistleblowers because the CFTC does not yet have that technology to actually surveil the markets, which I think they should. Um, and so I very much am in support of, to use Alton Klaus's word, the pre-partisanship of the Eliminate Barriers to Innovation Act, which I believe passed as part of a defense bill last year. I think I think as far as I know, we're waiting for it to pass the Senate, but that is a great bill because it puts together, well, first of all, it's bipartisan, strong Democrat support but all, and Republicans, but it also puts together this working group of the SEC and CFTC and private industry to really um, come up with suggestions as they are in the right place to do this. And then this may be a little bit revolutionary to raise here, but I would suggest it's time to look at the foreseeable long-term cost of regulating this industry, that both the CFTC and the SEC should have the funding to be able to regulate this. And I would like to point out, and this has been very controversial over the years, definitely a partisan issue, that you know, the CFTC is the only financial regulator right now that doesn't have that self-funding. You know, The SEC has their Section 31 fees. The CFTC still doesn't have that. And I think they should not have to go back each year to ask Congress for their budget. And a couple of years ago, it was cut by like 10%. Like they can't just cut their staff and technology. You know, the SEC has excellent um, surveillance unit. They have DIRA, they have great technology that they have built up through the course of their budget and long-term planning. So long-term, long, you know, short answer there is I think both the SEC and CFTC can be very um, important regulators. And I think funding, should definitely be a question. Maybe funding modernization at the SEC too, right? The SEC's budget so far is um, based on 31 fees, which is trading activity, you know, credit rating agencies and crypto are also areas they regulate that um, don't pay in. Um, and then both agencies are revenue positive. Like if we care about the bottom line, I just pulled the numbers, you know, the SEC budget was 1.9 billion. Well, guess what? They, they assessed twice as many fines last year. It was 4.8. I think over four and a half billion dollars in fines that goes to the general treasury, but 
at the end of the day, they're net positive, right? The CFTC has actually done a very impressive job. Their budget was 394 million and they actually assess 1.4 billion in penalties and fines. So I think we need to fund both of these regulators. They are doing a lot right now. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the crypto industry generally, right? Like there are over 12,000 different types of cryptocurrency. And I personally, not to like simplify it too much to find cryptocurrency as a digital asset on a blockchain, right? That digital asset could be a currency. It could be a commodity. It could be much like an equity and let the regulators decide that. That is not the role for Congress to decide. That is something that should go through the whole uh, notice and rulemaking process that we have in place already. So I think the sooner we can get clarity on who regulates what, the better. I think that working group is an A plus. I think that's a home run. It may not settle all the issues. And then I think we have to give them the money to do their job. We need a strong cop on the beat. And at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be a balance between innovation and regulation. They can go hand in hand. And the more clear the regulation is, the better the reg tech industry that will be there to flourish, to help independent companies comply with regulation. So I'll leave it at that. I don't know if it was seven minutes, but I talk at 2X. So I think I probably got 14 minutes into these seven minutes. That, that, was, that, that, was, that was great. And, and you, you know how to sort of win a regulator's heart by telling them that they need more money. Okay. I heard uh, the regulators. So You heard the regulators. Uh, Dante, uh, why don't you take a shot? All right. Well, first of all, thank you for the the panel and the opportunity to be here and to join ranks with this great group here and to um, have heard out loud uh, Representative Auchincloss's call to action that Web3 can do better and would have failed if it didn't do better by the very people who have been left behind um, the existing financial system and analog rails. So I come from a place of risk and resilience, right? So up until very recently, I served on national on FEMA's National Security um, or National Advisory Council. And if you think about the things that you cannot do with your money in the context of COVID-19, uh, then, you, then you really fully and deeply understand what animates Circle's mission as a company, that you should be able to import and upload the dollar, the same experience that you and I once had when we turned our CDs into MP3s. You suddenly had programmability and control over how you could use your music, but the music was still safely stored in its native form in your drawer or in your bank. I think the concept of stable coins existing that are trusted, that are prudentially regulated, and that are fulfilling unfulfilled work and incomplete work in the global financial system because our brick and mortar banks have reached a point of diminishing returns. Wall Street serves people who have sufficient capital to withstand loss. And we do a lot of harm in our country, as we do around the world, under the guise of consumer protection. Uh, so, so I want to hear uh, Representative Auchincloss's call to action that Web3 has to have a higher standard of fulfilling promises that have not been kept by Web1 and Web2. And then to do so meaningfully in a well-regulated manner is also a high standard as well. So I completely subscribe to what, what um, Kirsten was outlining at the outset. But then I would also argue that if the number of licenses held by a company is a proxy for being well-regulated, then Circle as a business is amongst the, the best regulated on the planet. We are licensed akin to companies like PayPal. Many early crypto companies, often to their peril, ignored the pre-existence of agencies like the CFTC or the SEC or state money transmission regulators. And I'm afraid that our country, unless we come to terms with the operating reality that the states have been the laboratory for responsible financial services innovation in America, then we're going to end up in a fintech constitutional crisis. So pre-partisan is the right approach, but the stakes are not just domestic, the stakes are global. The United States is competing in a very fierce, pitted digital currency space race. As a company and as a leader, I've been making this call out loud and Circle went as loud as saying we're going to put a full page national ad campaign in place to say this is how you win the digital currency space race. For some, winning it is prescriptive and the government must pick technology winners and losers or the government must stand between you and your wallet and how you spend your money at all levels eroding privacy and you know, entering the specter of deplatforming people from their money. In our view, the best way to win a digital currency space race is to spur responsible financial services innovation and competition, but to keep a vibrant private sector as a part of what that looks like. And the time, talent, and treasure represented in the $2.6 trillion crypto assets market 
is exactly the kind of innovation and exactly the kind of entrepreneurs we want to harness here in the United States. So I've been I've been party to all of the major hearings on this topic since 2019. I was myself just in the hot seat in the Senate very recently in, in December of last year. And I think we're now at a point where you could start to see that consensus coming to play. Uh, the PWG, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, has asked Congress for additional authorities to regulate this domain. I think what we like the most of the PWG's recommendations is that it acknowledged that stable coins as an innovation, granting that not all of them are created equal, belong under prudential regulatory frameworks, like for like. One of the best standards regulators set is same risk, same rules, technology neutrality. Yet I often find that much of the conversation is, is uh, uh, does not like the technology because of what it may empower, but what it empowers is the feature, not the bug. Digital assets, that empower people that are democratizing and that level the playing field from Wall Street down to Main Street and to empower us in novel ways in how we send, spend, save, and secure our money are uniquely American in their ideals and they should be embraced in the United States. And sorry, Mike, you're on mute. <laughs> that, that was great, thank you. Okay, uh, Michael, take a shot. Thanks, Michael. And yeah, it's a tough act to follow Kirsten and, and Dante, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I echo a lot of what they both said and what the congressman said as well. I think that regulators have a tough job when any new and innovative technology like crypto, Web3, blockchain comes along. And uh, we continue to be impressed with, with their level of engagement and, with, and <clears throat> with their ability to become smart on this space, considering how quickly it evolves. You know, we all spend our days deep in the trenches on these issues, and uh, it's still a challenge to stay on top of all the evolution and all the growth and all the technological innovation that's going on in this space. So I really do commend the, the forward-thinking regulators who are doing their best to try to get smart and do it the right way. Um, and I think that what we want to see is rather than regulation by enforcement, we want something more akin to, to what happened in the 90s with the birth of the internet. You know, there was a do no harm approach that fostered innovation that allowed the United States to become the hub of the internet and all of the economic, geopolitical, national security benefits that flowed from that. And I think we're now on the verge of this, this iteration of the internet into Web3. And it's incredibly important for the United States, as, as Dante mentioned, to maintain its global competitiveness and to maintain its position vis-a-vis -vis China and other actors as the global center for the future of the internet. And when you think about that and you think about how important that is, that doesn't mean that there's no space for regulation. We're eager to partner and be responsible partners with politicians, with regulators, especially like Congressman uh, Alvin Voss, who want to build a system that is a better financial system that brings in the unbanked and the underbanked, that incentivizes green energy, that enhances privacy, data security, transparency, that enables a better system for our society to function in all of those areas, right? So that's, it's the financial realm, it's, it's the consumer realm, it's the data and privacy realm, it's all of it. And I think that we really believe that you can do that in a way that protects consumers, protects investors, protects the environment um, while fostering innovation, while allowing industry to thrive. Um, and I personally am really excited to, to work together with Dante, with, Chris, with Kirsten, with the congressman on promoting these issues because it, it really is incredibly exciting and it's incredibly important, I think, we're at a pivot point right now, and we can really do great things as, as an industry and as a country, or we could be left behind. And I don't think anyone really wants that. So uh, I'm excited to, to work with the, the industry and the regulators and the political leaders to get there. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I, have a, I have tons of questions for the panelists, but I encourage uh, people in the audience to, uh, to, if they have questions, to put it in the Q&A box and hopefully we'll get to them too. Um, first question is, um, everybody on the panel is, is happy to work with the regulators. That's, that's, a, that's, a, good, that's a good sign, okay? Um, 
What is the biggest mistake that the Biden administration should try to avoid in as it as it lays out its regulatory framework? What's the what is what is the one thing if you could sort of whisper in their ear and tell them one thing to avoid? What would you tell them, uh, Kirsten? I mean, conceptually, I would say to avoid being too prescriptive and to keep things more principles based and to really give the regulators a lot of. I'd say discretion and authority to, to promulgate laws, because I'll tell you this, like things are going to change. They've changed so quickly already. We already have of that $2.6 trillion market Dante noted, I think 1.5% are NFTs as that industry matures, they're going to be whole new issues um, that may be more consumer related or IP related. We don't know yet that will emerge. And if we make things too prescriptive right now, we will not um, kind of leave room open for those regulators to pivot and adjust. So I think um, principles based rather than too prescriptive. Uh, Dante, what would you, what would you tell the, what, what, what would you whisper in their ear if you could sort of whisper? Well, one the, the good news, the good news is when you, when you say it out loud and you take out national ads, you don't have to whisper it. I, I would say, okay, good, good I, you to know, hear that. I, I would say the stakes are high. And, and the, I cannot underscore enough the, the sort of geopolitical and geoeconomic implications of us living in a society that does not have mobile native payments at scale, and that could not mobilize the 6.6 .6 plus trillion dollars of taxpayer funds to our population because the rails are antiquated and leaky and opaque. That's a national security vulnerability. No outside country visited that upon the United States. That is a lack of competition in payments and moving money. Now. So, so that message, I think, would be the one I would share with the administration. The other one is don't, don't create policies or executive orders in a void of talking to industry. Hopefully, on the other side of this executive order, industry is convened. The capital providers, there's a reason funds like Andreessen Horowitz and others are tripling down, uh, and DCG and, and, and others are tripling down in this industry. These are very, very smart U.S. investors that must be onto something, right? The very progenitors of web one are making long bets on web three. And I think creating policy in a void of industry at the table is problematic. That's an easy fix as well. We're all here. None of us are afraid of being regulated. Everyone who's present, I think represents a different corner of the market, but, but the policy discussion today is in a void of industry at the table. And we need a whole of government approach and a whole of industry approach to get it right. Michael? Yeah, I, I second what Kirsten and Dante said. Uh, and I think that I would also just add, you know, the watchword for me would be, or watch words would be clarity and transparency. And I think, you know, a lot of players in the industry are trying very hard to get right with the law and figure out how, how they can work with regulators. And there is a lack of clarity and a lack of transparency right now with some of the regulatory agencies um, that, is holding back industry and holding back America in, in this next Web3 um, world. And I think, you know, we have a, a trust crisis in, a, in institutions right now in, in America and, and across the globe. And part of that is because people feel like they don't know what's going on. They don't know why, they don't know what. And if you have regulatory agencies uh, handing down decisions from on high without actually providing reasoning uh, or, or transparency into their decision making, you're going to worsen the uh, trust deficit. You're going to undermine the very mission of these institutions, which is to protect consumers, protect investors. And I think we can put the focus back on clarity and transparency and we'll do a lot of good. That's great. Um, so it sounds like you're all on the same page in terms of what you would sort of tell them. Let me, let me ask you, we're talking about this as a competitiveness question. What other countries are doing, are, are potentially doing a better job of regulation? And I don't, so, and it could be sort of small countries that are, um, that are not potential um, real rivals to the US, but actually are sort of good examples, or it could be larger countries that have the potential to be a better home. Uh, Dante, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, I suppose it is it is a, a topic I brought up, and so I should probably own round one. Um, well, there, there are a number of jurisdictions and countries on the planet that you could argue whether they're direct competitors to the United States or not have been absolute leaders in embracing uh, this, embracing and being early in, in identifying Web3 as an opportunity. 
Uh, one of the leading lights is Bermuda, uh, which, you know, while small, 65,000 people strong, the Atlantic outpost, uh, nonetheless has really had a whole of government approach and a very comprehensive regulatory and legal framework that does not give the industry a pass because this is an industry that's fraught with regulatory arbitrage risk and a race to the bottom in some corners of the industry. But Bermuda would be an example where it's comprehensive digital assets business act early set a tone for enabling the industry and set a tone for risk-based um, underwriting of that industry. Now, there are other places on the planet. Europe is another example. The Europeans have a 600 plus page body of law coming into force called the Markets and Crypto Assets Framework. We have a 23 page policy recommendation from the president's working group. Now, GDP, uh, MICA as it's known, will be to crypto what GDPR was to privacy unless the United States comes to a whole of government approach to this industry. So that's a gap. And Europe, of course, is a friendly partner uh, to us. But nonetheless, it's, it's showing that it's a whole of government approach to the industry. And then lastly, China has a whole of government blockchain strategy and a production scale digital currency issued by its central bank and plugged into the WeChat Pay program that may already have up to 200 million users in it. Now, I'm not suggesting that the best model for the United States is to out China China. What I am suggesting that there is an entire country that has a parallel money transfer system and we have no alternatives at scale that are receiving the endorsement or the imprimatur of the federal government. That's a problem. Michael? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I have much more to add on top of it. You don't have to add it, you don't have to add it anymore if you don't, if you don't want to. Then. Yeah, but, but the other say, questions. Yeah, but I would say that I do think that uh, ultimately we need to take the best of all of these countries, right? You know, we, we're seeing parts of the European policy, parts of the Chinese policy, parts of what you're seeing in Singapore. Uh, we have an entity in Bermuda. We dealt directly with the Digital Assets Business Act and have found it to have the exact kind of clarity and transparency that I was talking about before. Um, so I think that we, there are examples out there. We're not just, it's not just white space. And I think that the whole of government approach that, that Dr. Davis mentioned, when you can take from the best of what we're doing here in the United States and then what we've seen work in, in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in Bermuda, uh, will enable us to create a, a world-class system, regulatory regime around digital assets and web three. Kirsten, you want to add anything? You can take a pass. Sure, I know I'll add to that. I mean, I there's some countries people may not be following, like Germany. They just quietly last July, Boffin, Bundesfinanzministerium, put out a security token offering um, rule that also creates a secondary market for tokens that is not available in the US yet. And so I think what that highlights, and I think Liechtenstein as well has put out further clarity than we have now. And that's just a contrast when you look at the equities markets in the US where people from all around the world come here to invest in a highly regulated and clear equities market. By contrast, we're seeing people in the US migrating to other jurisdictions to invest perhaps in crypto ETFs, right? And until, I mean, it makes sense, right? That regulators want surveillance in the underlying cash crypto markets before they'll allow an ETF here. But it's just strange that money from the US is going to other jurisdictions. It's flowing elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So we, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, let's start here. What are the panelists' thoughts on the regulatory complications that will stem from the lack or ability to standards, the standardize the definition of cryptocurrency, particularly considering how dynamic and amorphous the underlying technologies are? Who would like, we not, with this not for everybody, if, who would like to sort of take a shot at that? Well, I'm, I'm happy to provide just a, a word. Um, I think, you know, it is one of these really important points in that the term of art stable coins, for example, misses the fact that not all stable coins are created equal. Equally, the term of art blockchain means one thing to one person and, and one thing to another, and not all are created equal. And, and I, I do think to double click, um, pun intended, on, on the term cryptocurrencies and to have the classifications be a part of how they are treated is really important. Um, so to the same risk, same rules, technology neutral approach to regulation, I would add one more pillar, which is that underwrite and review and regulate the economic behavior of the digital asset. If it behaves like a security, it's very likely a security. If it behaves, however, like a payment instrument with no economic expectation of a return, it should be regulated as such. We have rules for that. It's called money transmission. Europe has rules for that. It's called e-money. And so I think the problem we're facing is that we're not bothering to go deep 
until just very recently, a lot of our public hearings have been superficial. Now we're starting to see hearings that are going deeper into understanding the opportunities, the risks, the distinctions. And, and, and so I'm hopeful now that we can get out of a, a regulatory deadlock and start getting things moving again. Anybody else wants to take a turn or is that good enough for now? Okay, let's move on to the next question. This is a, this is a fundamental question, which is, who should regulate is an important question, but has there been a consensus about the question of what market failure is there that specifically calls for regulation? That's such a nice way of asking the question, why, why are we doing this at all? Okay, so what's your thought about that? Michael? Yeah, I, I think that it's such a good way of putting the question because if you look at some of the actions from regulators recently, you have to ask yourself, you know, what are they, what problem is even trying to be solved here? Um, and it's not entirely clear often what it is other than this idea of potentially like everything is a security, therefore we must uh, impose on high what that means. And I think that doesn't make sense in this new world where the technology and uh, the, the elements of different aspects of this ecosystem require more nuance, more detail, more understanding. And so I think that the, the question was absolutely right in the sense of like regulation in and of itself isn't the goal, right? It's we want to protect consumers, but we don't want to do it in the way where, you know, harm is enabled through the guise of consumer protection. We want to ensure for uh, American security, national security issues that, that things are for protected. We want to make sure that we are fostering innovation. To me, if you're looking at what the goal should be, the goal should be to protect investors actually, um, to apply the laws that we have in the right way. Uh, as Dante said, like we have laws for this. We have regulations for this. We have an understanding of how to approach some of this stuff. We can't just try to oversimplify everything and throw it all into one bucket um, when, when everything is so different. And so I, I don't, and I don't believe that we should be just regulating in the name of regulation itself. So we have to say, what you're saying is we have to sort of ask what the market failure is. What, what is the, pro, what are we actually trying to sort of get at? Yeah, and I, I don't believe that there is a by and large market failure here. I think that what you were seeing is the market working. I think you were seeing projects and companies and protocols and innovations that are working rising to the top and those that are not and those that are perhaps uh, not a good example or a good use of this technology fail um, and coming under the scrutiny from regulators or from law enforcement. And that's, that's the system working. And I, I find it um, frustrating sometimes when people say, oh, crypto is the wild west. Uh, there's no rules. And it's like, we spend so much of our time across ECG, across our subsidiaries, some of the bigger names in the space, Grayscale, Genesis, Foundry, Luno, Coindesk, like we spend a lot of time dealing with regulators at the federal, state, and international level. Um, I know that that is the case with many of our portfolio companies that we invest in, including Circle. And so I think that to, to, to say that this is there's some sort of market failure or that um, this is a wild west doesn't actually reflect the facts on it. It's a really good point. Anybody else want to sort of say a word? On I was the, just uh, at one very small adjoinder um, because obviously, again, as a risk person, the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, just put out another 30 page paper highlighting all of the risks to the crypto assets market. But the crypto industry was born from a market failure in traditional finance, what the cryptopians call TradeFi, right? Or TradFi, which was post 2008. We had this model, this total disequilibrium in the model of privatizing gains and socializing losses. And we also revealed what we could not do with money and what we could not do with capital markets uh, at scale in serving hosts of, of real people. 200 million plus people today are involved in this industry. And I think that's a population scale tipping point. So we're looking very heavily for market failures in crypto, but so much of crypto was born from a market failure in the traditional financial segment. The other thing is, again, not to say that it gets a pass. It, it's that I think the industry managed well and regulated well is completing unfinished work for what you cannot do with money, what you cannot do with capital markets and has an opportunity to get, make it much, much more inclusive at its core. I would add in, 
maybe just for a second on top of what you said though. I mean, I think, yes, like the, the payment system has been broken. Like we're all paying 2% fees for credit cards, right? And obviously cross-border cash remittances are high, but as far as the capital, like the equities markets, it's never been a better time to invest. Like it's, it's been the most efficient markets um, that we've seen in decades. But I think, um, you know, when one reads about headlines like open seas, that 80% of the NFTs on the platform were fraudulent or IP violations, it does make you wonder like what, and that was a really great step of open seas to go out and admit that, right? But there needs to be self-regulation and there also needs to be some I think it's very important that the regulators have the tools for surveillance because clearly there's whatever industry you're in, there's a percentage of bad apples out there that, you know, to have complete, you know, blind faith in the system working out, you know, ignores the fact that there are some bad actors out there and that consumers need to be protected. I, what's interesting, uh, uh, Kirsten and, and Dante, in, in sort of talking about the uh, financial crisis is it was clear that the regulators did not have the surveillance tools that they needed for the um, back then for for derivatives of various sorts, and and in some in some sense you're you're being you're being tarred with the with the with the pain of the last crisis, which is the way that it always works, right? And the regulators were were terribly blindsided at that point. The data that they had was not accurate. They had no clue about what was going on, and and the the question is is what what kind of what is the structure of surveillance that they need that they need now to um, uh, to make them feel to make them and to make everybody else feel comfortable? Let's hold on to that question. I want to sort of get to another audience question. Okay, so it's it's kind of a logical one at this point after after the uh, congressman talked about stable coins, and and we know that CBCs are coming too. It says uh, since central bank digital currencies are being considered by the Fed, what would a CB, CBDC look like that still leaves room for private stablecoin innovation? And I think a related question is, as the Congressman said, what, what, what attention do we need to pay to stablecoin, stablecoins that is kind of different from the, this, this broader uh, framework that we're building? Who'd like to sort of take a, take a shot at that? Well, I'm happy to start as a stablecoin yeah. operator, maybe with the uh, so so um, one. I have very 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 strong views on the record, predating any of the recent hearings that we've had. That a central bank going down the misadventure of digitizing its national thrift would be the equivalent of the Federal Aviation Authority choosing to fly planes and build jet engines. The better posture because I don't believe that we're in this internet wild, wild west of banking that, uh, that Michael just described. But the better posture, back to my FAA analogy, is the FAA should designate, like a central bank, safe airspace, safe operating space, and a safe set of standards around trust, transparency, accountability. And that once those are met, we should embrace the existence of a trusted, always-on form of digital dollars because our financial needs do not take bank holidays. And because we have enormous frictions that are extractive of the people in the communities who could afford it the least in our conventional payment systems. And so that, that's where I think the privately issued trusted stablecoin segment like USDC and Circle to Live In um, are really fulfilling a lot of important work in just critical global financial markets infrastructure. And I think foundational to helping the US win the digital currency space race. The alternative, a hundred year technology bet made by our government that transposes free market R&D that is capitalizing billions and billions of dollars of new industries and creating thousands of jobs is bad for the United States, bad for two-tiered banking, will be bad for consumers. But I don't suggest for a second that stable coins and CBDCs cannot coexist. I just think the model at the moment is, is flawed and we're trying to respond to big tech competition and we're trying to respond to China. I think we have better ways of doing that. You know, <clears throat> the, the do other people have comments on this? Because I think this is a question we need to sort of drill down into a, a little bit more. Okay, Kirsten? Oh, I was just gonna give a shout out to Jennifer Lassiter at Digital Dollar Project for anyone listening, because she's been a huge resource on just digital dollar and stable coins. Um, and they that organization, which was fairly recently established, I think in October, um, just has a wealth of information. Um, and, you know, from my conversations with her, yeah, just being able to coexist <laughs> Exactly. 
the author of Crypto Dot himself as part of it. Um, but Jennifer is fantastic. And she has walked me through like use cases of stable coins. And, you know, I host a podcast, Crypto Study Hall, that she was a guest on twice just to go over it. Because I think it's such an evolving space. And, you know, Dante raises a great point, right? We're looking at other countries that are creating their own, you know, stable coin markets, right? And if we fall behind, you know, is a Chinese swan going to become the currency of maybe Africa. I don't know. There are all sorts of things that sound like sci-fi now that could really happen. So I would just, you know, for anyone listening, reach out to Digital Dollars Project. I think they're fantastic on this. So the congressman talked about the need to audit stable coins. What was he talking about then? And was he correct? Don't think, what are, what yeah, no, ha happy. I, I think it's a, I think he's entirely correct. Uh, and I think that to the extent, so here, here are two quick points that sort of pick up the nuance, right? That in a world where stable coins are no longer, they're, they're, they're not too big to fail, but they're too big to ignore from a systemic risk point of view, then you need to have a satisfactory approach to the show me the money question. Stable coins were designed to solve for crypto's original sin, which was buyer's and spender's remorse. If you spent a Bitcoin in, on pizza, you really regretted it the morning after because <laughs> of hyper volatility. And maybe you have some famous friends who came to your pizza party. But that's not a particularly great way to build an, a global payment instrument that is frictionless and high trust. So the show me the money question is massively important. And the crypto industry during the ICO bubble, armed with a lot of vaporware and slick websites, defrauded a lot of people of a lot of money. And a lot of things were masquerading as stable coins, even till today, that are anything but stable. So I, I completely subscribe to the notion that there should be harmonized standards on trust, transparency, and accountability. Circle today is following a model that is excessive of our payment system licenses, but it's a, it's a voluntary choice that we make as a business. And so to the extent that is harmonized, uh, I think it's a great starting point and it's risk-based. Um, so completely subscribe to that approach. So let me circle around to the original question that, that, I, that I asked that got kind of a partial answer, which is who should be, who should be, regulating, who should be regulating this space? I mean, uh, Kirsten, you sort of talked about the SEC and the CFTC. Does Treasury have a role? Does the Federal Reserve have a role? I mean, it, you know, is there, is there, is, should there be somebody else who's kind of looking at the systemic risk questions? Um, who should be regulating NFTs? I know this kind of is an enormous question unto itself. Oh, huge question, right? I mean, on stable coins, I would let Dante answer that. I think on NFTs, you know, I think we're going to see a progression where NFTs go through some of the same kind of regulatory growing pains that we saw the ICOs go through. Because really, if you are creating a marketplace to fractionalize ownership of anything from like um, a song to a fractional ownership in you know, real estate to a fractional ownership of a business, and you're, you could go the NFT route or a token route, right? And so I think we're going to go through a lot of the same um very basic questions with NFTs and everyone is expecting that market to grow. So NFTs are going to be, I think, like a lot of the uh, coin offerings. It could be in many different agencies. So there's not like a simple answer, I guess. It depends on the use of that NFT. And, and there could be oh. a very mundane application for Seable. Like people might have an NFT that serves as a smart contract warranty on their toaster oven. It might be very unglamorous NFTs that we're seeing in the future. And that so, might so be- So you're talking about that being regulated by the FTC then? That could be FTC. That's what I'm saying. We have to think really big. And it, it's like, you know, this is, I feel like I'm in my college dorm room talking at 2am, but it could be any number of agencies, which is why I said earlier, we could not make it too prescriptive. It needs to be, we need to keep things a little bit flexible, but we can't let it not be regulated or you fall prey to kind of regulatory arbitrage right. and kind to, to kind of rejigger things. So there's no regulation, which at the end of the day is bad for innovation because people can't build their business models. Michael, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think Kirsten's exactly right. Like, I, I, first of all, echo her earlier point about funding with regard to the CFTC, because I think it's, it's incredibly important. And I think, um, you know, the NFT example is a great one, because there is no one answer necessarily, and that's okay, right? Like, that's, that's the promise of this technology, that it can serve a lot of different purposes, that it can be used in a lot of different ways, such that it may come under the regulatory uh, um, scope of the CFTC or the FTC or something else. And I think the idea is you don't want to be in search of 
um, some all powerful regulator that's going to handle every aspect of this diverse and innovative ecosystem. I think that we have the tools and we have the ability of the various agencies with their particular skill sets to be able to get smart as they're trying to on this emerging and evolving technology and apply the right kind of law, the right kind of regulation. So yes, you don't have uh, investors or consumers being defrauded, but you also don't have um, a complete stifling and strangulation of this industry. Dante, you want to add anything? Sure. Um, well, <laughs> you, you always seem to answer yes when I ask you that question. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've, I know better than to say no to uh, uh, an economist and a respected thought leader. So, um, the, the the short answer is I do think we I don't think we need a new stand standalone regulator for this stuff. I don't think it's that novel, frankly. If you want to understand the future of money and payments, past is prologue and. We have today 50 state regulators who would beg to differ that they don't know how to manage the regulation of electronic money or the movement of money. What we do not have is a federal pathway for payment systems innovations to exist. So free advice for American global economic competitiveness. Other jurisdictions do. Uh, Switzerland has a very comprehensive financial markets infrastructure license that is nationally regulated. And I think that's the gap is, is back to where I left. I think Stable coins that are trusted and well-regulated and a part of the payment system belong under the house of prudential regulation and state money transmission. But it should be risk-based and it should not just assume that all stable coins are created equal because that will have some adverse effects on competition and the next person who's going to compete with Circle. I would love to see people show up who can compete with Circle on a level playing field. But Circle and others have to be able to compete with very large global systemic banks and very large global systemic players that have national advantages we do not currently enjoy. Um, and I think we're currently winning the digital currency space race to make that absolutely clear. But I don't think that 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 victory is long assured unless we figure out how to get it right and harness this kind of whole of country, whole of government, whole of society approach to innovating. And technology is one of the fundamental pillars of getting that right. So we have one last question from the audience, which will be your ending, which will be your ending answer as well. And it's if Congress could only pass one bill this year related to digital assets, what policy gap should it address? And um, Kirsten, why don't you go first? Well, I would say the bill I'd want passed is funding for the CFTC, but that doesn't quite answer the question, does it? No, it and actually I, does. No, it does. That's, that's, if that, it does. If that's you know why? Because I, like I said, I have a strong preference that, you know, a strong cop on the beat builds more confidence and that, you know, it actually helps. It actually really helps the companies innovate. If you have clarity and strong surveillance, at least in the equities markets, you have a whole flourishing industry of reg tech that helps vendors that help people comply with regulation. If we know what we need and if the regulators are funded to do their job, we're gonna move so much faster through this kind of growth pain of regulation. Of is there any regulation yeah. that, you talked about surveillance several times, is there anything we need to do in the legislative space to sort of empower the right degree of the surveillance? I think it's just funding. I look at DIRA at the SEC as a great success story. And, you know, the SEC is using AI and machine learning to detect fraud and abuse. There's no reason that the CFTC can't be using that as well. And I think surveillance should be easier on a blockchain. Theoretically, like the kimonos are already open, like everything is already on a public ledger. So um, I would hope that makes things even easier for surveillance, but I think we got to get our regulators funded and that will instill more confidence. So, Michael, what what policy gap would you want filled if you could? I mean, you're sort of I sort of I already sort of asked people sort of what would you whisper in 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 the in, in, in Biden's ear, and now I'm sort of saying what if you could actually make Congress pass a bill, which is kind of a magic wand at this point. Um, yeah, I, mean, would, I, I think that my first thing that I would just say is what I said earlier, which is do no harm. So, if anything, I would say it's better to do to do no harm first than to pass legislation that, that will have a, a ton of unintended consequences that would be harmful to American global competitiveness and, uh, you know, strangle the, the industry. Um, and I think that that said, you know, clarity around treatment of digital assets and how to approach that such that the industry has an understanding of how to move forward, how to invest, where to put resources, where to, uh, fix things to, to get right with the law. I think legislation around that, a bit of a big lift, um, 
could be really helpful to, to the industry. Is there anything is there anything in Congress right now that would sort of do that? You know, I think that there are a lot of bills floating around or, or in the offing. Um, I think we have some really promising uh, young House Democrats like Congressman uh, Alex Loss, and I think you have obviously Darren Soto in Florida, you have Representative Emmer on the Republican side. In the Senate, you have a lot of interest from senators like Pat Toomey, Mark Warner, Ron Wyden, uh, Cynthia Lum Lummis, and I think that there is a real desire. And we really did see this uh, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill situation around tax treatment. Uh, you really saw there is a genuine desire to get it right among politicians on both sides. And so I think ensuring that this is pretty political, that this is a American global competitiveness concern rather than a democratic issue or a Republican issue is, is really important. And I think there are some really good bills both in the House and, and in the Senate that could start to get this right. Okay. Dante, you've got uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Well, I, I won't call for specific bills because I feel like I'm the subject of many of them at the moment, and I don't <laughs> want to preempt nor turn it into a partisan issue. But I, I completely subscribe with the view that uh, better funded CFTC and better funded agencies make for better uh, regulations and more sensible regulations, because in the void of regulatory clarity, then people are policy. So step one. Uh, step two, what is missing, frankly, of a lot of the, the papers and the reports that are coming out of the government these days uh, is a preamble. Uh, Chris Giancarlo and I actually were on a panel together when the PWG report was first issued, and we both observed at the same time, despite the fact that he and I might have different versions of what that digital currency future looks like in its form, we both felt that if we were going to win the digital currency space race, then it would be great if our public leaders also acknowledged the, the preamble that should come with the heavy on the risk reports that are being issued publicly. What is the art of the possible? Where can we not move money today? Where have our capital markets failed? Why are we having such systemic and pervasive amounts of financial exclusion, even in a fortress nation like this one? And it's not just that technology is a panacea. It's that the failure to innovate is a problem and it's endemic in our society. And Web3 is presenting us a shot at starting to rectify some of the ills of the tech titan era where all the value went to one postal code in California. We have a shot and blockchain and crypto represents our best shot at, at creating a slightly more equitable world. So that's what I would say. We need so that preamble wanna, you wanna, on that you, mission. So you want a, vi you want a, you want a vision? A hundred percent. You want a vision. By the so, end of this decade, we'll put a man on the moon. We did it. What is our national strategy for economic competitiveness with emerging tech? We don't have I, one. I, I actually thought that you were going to say by the end of this panel, we would have one. Well, no, thank you, you. you have digital dollars. I could beam money to you on the moon, but you, you don't have a national strategy that accompanies them. Okay. <laughs> so let me, let me thank, let me thank the, the members of the panel. You've been great. Uh, thank the, uh, the, uh, the congressman. And thank uh, uh, Colin for uh, Mortimer for putting this together. Thank you all. You've been, you've been terrific. And uh, and thank the audience too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.